Yolanda, it's so good to be talking with you today. And what I'm really keen to understand is how does an organisation become more highly reliable? That's, that's a great question. And uh, one of the things that I would say as a start, it's, it's not about looking at how you fare against a checklist. Um, so the important thing is uh, thinking about, I mean, it's a very obvious point. If you want to know uh, uh, how you can become an HRO, you first need to understand what you are right now. So it needs to involve an assessment of um, yeah, what, what's happening on the ground? What's happening at every level of the organization? Managers, but also employees, uh, uh, you know, on the ground. What are they doing in terms of safety? So are you saying this is some sort of baseline assessment of where you are Absolutely. now? Yeah, yeah. So, so how do you do that? Yeah, that's a good point too. Uh, I guess if it requires really going in the organization. It requires you to start talking to people. It's to really understand the culture. What are they doing? Uh, and uh, so, and, and that again is at every possible level. Mm -hmm. It's not something, you can't be an HRO if it's only the managers at the top uh -huh. who actually feel that it's important to act in line with safety uh, regulations. It needs to be everyone uh, at every part of the organization. Um, and so in that sense, you're very much talking about uh, the importance of, of uh, not just, uh, maybe another point I would make, that it's not just about um, looking at people as individual employees, whether they actually know exactly what it says in the safety manual, it is about looking at them uh, as part of teams, mm -hmm. of collectives, of the organization as a whole. Um, and then it is very much about to what extent is it, it you know, what, what kind of culture do they think they have around safety? Do they, for instance, feel that uh, it is valued and it is rewarded if they report incidents? Uh, or are they just too concerned about, well, if I report all the things that are going wrong or that I see are not optimal here, am I just, uh, you know, am I just getting punished for that in terms of, you know, my next promotion and things like that? So it is very much about uh, looking at the organization as, uh, as a whole, as a collective, rather than just at the individuals within it. And, and it's not just about reporting, is it? I mean, it, you, you talk about, um, in some of your work, about how people communicate with each other, about uh, what information they share, uh, how they work together. So, so when you're doing this baseline assessment, what should you be trying to understand? I guess one of the uh, important things here is, as I said, it's not about individuals, it's about the groups, but it's also very much about understanding the dynamics between the different groups. Mm -hmm. um, it may well be that uh, you have, in every organization, uh, there's, there's not one safety culture. There are yes. many, many different safety cultures. Mm -hmm. yeah. Every team probably thinks differently about safety. How important is it and how much do we value it? So that's something important to map out at the team level, mm -hmm. not just at the individual mm -hmm. level. But then it's also about understanding those dynamics between the teams. Is it the case that you know, they may actually take safety very serious because we don't really like them anyway, we think they're a <laughs> nuisance, that we're going to do something different. Yeah. So it is about understanding those relationships between groups, but also the barriers for them to, to really get together and to really see themselves as being on the same page. So you're talking about a real mapping exercise, aren't yep. you, yep. in the organisation? And, and I suppose I equate that to that real understanding of, of your organisation that Wyke and, and Sutcliffe talk about. Yep. So the mapping, I mean, how might, what's, what's the practical means by which you go about mapping your organisational culture and behaviours? Yeah, I guess, uh, I guess the important point to make here, uh, you cannot do that sitting behind your desk. You need to go out there, you need to talk to people, really get a good understanding of what they think is valued in the organisation, what they're trying to achieve, what they think is acceptable in terms of safety uh, breaches, say. And I guess then the important question is more, what, what are you going to assess? If you go in and try and get a real good handle of what is the baseline here, mm -hmm. uh, I would recommend it's not just about looking at the number of incidents, what exactly happened, but it is about asking those questions about, well, if there is an incident, as an employee, do you feel 
a, a liberty to actually report that? Do you feel that's valued? Or do you think that managers will just get upset with you because you're making, the, making everything more complicated, right? So it's about really getting an understanding of on the ground, what are people's perceptions of safety? Uh, and to what extent do they feel it's valued? You've mentioned groups, groups yep. and teams, and I suppose we've, we're sort of socialised to think that groupthink is bad. But I think I'm hearing you say that you understand how the groups work is actually a really useful thing to do, and a group identity is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's exactly what I would argue. Um, if you again look at our starting points, we're saying that it's all about leadership, but leadership requires you to actually feel that there's a shared identity, a strong sense of us. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is true, as you say, that in the literature, it's very often that um, uh, strong teams, cohesive teams are seen as negatives, right? Uh, we associate them with uh, uh, uncritical thinking, bad decision making, and that may well be the case, uh, but it would be it would be a, a mistake, I think, to actually therefore say, okay, let's get rid of teams, let's get rid of that, let's just look at people uh, as individuals. Uh, instead, what you need to do is you need to uh, work with those strong, uh, uh, cohesive group identities, mm -hmm. and you need to uh, actually provide them with norms, we call it norms, mm -hmm. uh, that lead them to uh, engage in more critical thinking, where they value safety, but also where they have a very good shared understanding of how are we going to achieve that right, together. It's a collective enterprise, it's not just something that one individual does. And the focus you have on mapping, I think is really, really quite interesting because there's a bit of a tendency at times to think, okay, this site has this culture. But what you're saying is that the site may have many cultures. There's, there may be many things going on. So is it necessary to go right down to the individual crew or team level to really understand what's happening? Yeah, I would say it is. Uh -huh. I, I think that is uh, perhaps Maybe one of the issues, of course, if you simply do uh, go down the checklist yes. or look at the five principles, you get perhaps an idea of what's happening descriptively in the organisation as a whole. But that's not really what you need to know if you're really serious about preventing accidents mm -hmm, and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, to happen. It is about uh, mapping all of that out, what happens mm -hmm. in all the different aspects of the organisation. Yes. Uh, contractors, uh, all sorts of different staff. Different crews, different, different rotations. Crews. Yep. Yep. They all yep. have their own different ideas about safety uh, uh, and what's important, what's not important. You need to map that out and it's basically sort of then understanding how that as a whole works together. So it's the whole social organism that, that is That's the organisation right. yep. and how all the, all the parts relate to each yep. other or don't. Yeah. So you start with the baseline mapping, so the where are you now, yep. uh, and then how do you know you're making progress? Uh, again, if you sort of move away from the whole idea that it's not just checking how you're doing against a, a checklist, mm -hmm. against a safety manual, then it is... Uh, uh, it is really when people start to report back to you that they're actually engaging in safety initiatives, they take it serious because that's what they want to do, mm -hmm. right? It's mm -hmm. not something that is imposed on them because, uh, yeah, they're getting penalised if they're not acting in a particular way. It is when people start to say that this is important to me to and our team in particular to engage in a particular way. When you've, That's when you actually have evidence that you've changed the culture uh, uh, and that's, that people do it because it's consistent with their identity and uh, that's something that they're motivated to do. The interesting thing is, of course, if you simply look at uh, uh, the checklist and how well you're doing against that, you're basically uh, telling a child, you know, you, you, you're, you're taking a test, well, here you are, you're, you get a 50% or 70%. Or but a red light to... or a green traffic light in that's this industry. Right. Yeah. That's right, that's yeah. right. But yeah. at the same time, uh, what do you do with that information? If mm -hmm. you get that feedback, uh, that's great. But So I guess what we're trying to do is very much about creating a sort of a culture where people are knowing exactly how they actually can build that up mm -hmm. and achieve better outcomes. So I think I'm hearing you talk about different kinds of information being important. So it's not, it's not, just, not just numbers, it's not just 
uh, statistics. Absolutely. But it, but it sounds like you're saying it's how people are telling you they feel, why they're doing what they're doing. Uh, are you advocating a, a deeper ongoing understanding of your people or what would you say to leaders? What, what I think would be important to say to leaders is indeed to uh, rather, I mean, one of the big issues, and, and you know, I think that any parents would know that perhaps it is, if you go to your employees and say, look, this is what you need to do, this is a safety manual, just memorize it and we'll be fine, that you don't get great outcomes. It is once you actually start people engaging in the project mm -hmm. uh, uh, that, uh, when they actually start to embrace it as something that they find important, mm -hmm. then they are mm -hmm. also start to be creative. I mean, HRO is very much about thinking in, in new ways about how can we improve the environment mm -hmm. for everyone? How can we make it a safe place for everyone? It's not about just compliance. It's also mm -hmm. about a lot of creativity and how can we actually do better? And the role of leaders in all of this. So. Are leaders involved in the baseline? Where do you situate them as, as you're trying to progress towards being, being a more reliable organisation? I would say that leaders are important at every stage of that. Uh, it's, it's, about, it's important in getting them involved in the baseline assessments. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this is, I guess, something that Alex uh, uh, was talking about. A leader needs to be part of the team, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they need to be as one. Uh, followers need to uh, not simply see themselves as separate from the leader. They need to see themselves as one. So a leader needs to be part of the baseline uh, and needs to understand, okay, where are the gaps? Where do we perhaps have a different understanding of what needs to happen uh, in the space of safety compared to everyone else? But it's also then leaders are very important once they understand where the gap is to actually help to, well, help or to almost harness all the capacity that is there to build towards that HRO, to that sort of end goal that you might have in mind. So that baseline assessment is also a bit of a gap analysis from the sounds of things, because you, yep. you're looking to see, yep. okay, if I'm the leader, I imagine it's working like this, but oh goodness, I've just discovered it's actually not working that way. It, yep. Is it a gap analysis? Uh, yes, absolutely. But I would even say that you can only know what an HRO for your particular organisation looks like once you actually have a very good understanding of what you are right now. Yes. It's only then that you can uh, sort of really sort of set goals about who we want to be in the future, uh, uh, what kind of HRO do we want to be, and mm -hmm. that's different for every organisation. So I, certainly the baseline would be the starting point, and it's only once you've done that baseline analysis that you can even start to imagine the type of HRO that we want to become. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, it's maybe more a stage process. Mm -hmm. You never know what kind of HRO you can be if you don't know who you are right now. So Yolanda, you're talking about quite a deep level of engagement and I'm thinking in, in the real busy world that you know, companies are operating in, is this actually achievable? Yeah, I, I guess I would certainly want to say, uh, let's not be too pessimistic. It is achievable um, uh, and it is something that, uh, but I guess the important thing here to, to understand is that for every organisation there's a different roadmap. It's not as if we can simply come up with one roadmap and just make sure that you're on that road and you'll be fine. Every uh, organisation will have to come up with their own roadmap. And the other issue too there, it's, it's an ongoing process. You never reach the end of it uh, and it, it is something that requires work and it develops, it changes over time. Also, uh, it's responsive to the different challenges that an industry faces. So it needs to be adaptive, it needs to be fluid uh, and it's an ongoing process where people work together to actually get towards that HRO. So Yolanda, is there a roadmap that people can follow to become more highly reliable? Yes, I certainly think that that's a good way of thinking about it as a roadmap. But I also think it's important to keep in mind that every organisation will have to develop its own roadmap. Uh, we can't simply use a template that works for everyone. And the other point I would like to emphasise is that it's an ongoing process. You will never be at the end of the road and have reached your destination. You need to continue to work on this and, and, and develop uh, what it means to be an HRO for your organisation. 
So are you saying it's an ongoing journey, but it's a journey worth taking? Absolutely. Yelena, that's been fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susan.